This episode is brought to you by the One Love Foundation. Many stories on true crime podcasts start with abusive relationships. The numbers of people affected by relationship abuse are startling. Over one in three women, nearly one in three men, and over one in two trans non-binary people will be in an abusive relationship in their lifetimes. Abusive relationships rarely start with physical abuse. Instead, there are often red flags like manipulation, isolation, belittling, and volatility. Not all unhealthy relationships become abusive, but all abusive relationships start out as unhealthy ones. One Love Foundation, a national nonprofit dedicated to ending relationship abuse and creating a world of healthier relationships, wants to empower you to see the signs of an unhealthy relationship before things go too far. Go to joinonelove.org to see the signs and know how to help a friend who may be in an unhealthy relationship. That's joinonelove.org and learn how to spot the signs of unhealthy and healthy relationship behaviors. The Dateable Podcast is an insider's look into modern dating that the Huffington Post calls one of the top 10 podcasts about love and sex. On each episode, we'll talk to real daters about everything from sex parties to sex droughts, date fails to diaper fetishes, and first moves to first loves. I'm your host, Yue Shu, former dating coach turned dating sociologist. You'll also hear from my co-host and producer, Julie Kraftchik, as we explore this crazy dateable world. Hello, Datables. Welcome to another episode of the Datable Podcast. Whether you're dating, not dating, you're in a relationship, sort of in a relationship, in and out of relationships, <laughs> wherever you are in your life, you are in the right place with us <laughs> on the Datable Podcast. We do everything, basically. We're here for you, no matter where you're at. <laughs> we'll meet you there. We'll meet you there. Uh, I guess I, I was thinking that, that when we were talking about New Year's, we never talked about New Year's after it happened. We were like predicting what would happen for us on New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. Then we never like circle back. I feel like we should, you know, tell people what happened on New Year's Eve. Do you have like <laughs> that interesting of a New Year's Eve? Oh, yes, I guess you do. You you had a lot of changes. I was going to say mine probably wasn't that interesting <laughs> a month well, later, you, but I'll let you go you first. You didn't go to Mad River. <laughs> Well, Mad River is permanently closed, so I could not go to Mad River. <laughs> I cry. I cry so hard. But you did spend New Year's Eve in New York. I did. And it was really, really great. Honestly, this was actually one of my best New Year's because I feel like I did everything I wanted to do. I went to a comedy show. I went mm. to a really nice like prefix dinner tasting menu. My partner and I love to be fancy that way. Of course, yes. it was like so much more expensive because it was New Year's. Of course. Another whole deal. And then we saw fireworks. So it was really wonderful. I think, you know, I said it was like one of my favorite New Year's. You know, New Year's is not my favorite holiday. So saying that was actually a big thing. But you, I feel like you had the biggest news because you went to Taiwan. And you said last that you weren't going to go there. It's so weird. I actually ended up in Taiwan. It was a total (laughs) last minute trip. And ended up spending New Year's Eve there. It was not the best to New Year's Eve. Oh, We went to this club that everybody goes to. It's called C'est La Vie. If you're from... Oh, you actually went to C'est La Vie in Bangkok. It's the same chain. Oh, my God, I did. You spent New Year's Eve. Your partner was there, and I didn't know him then. We realized this years later. (laughs) Yeah, I did not like that place. (laughs) Say <laughs> La Vie is a place you go to in Asia, all around Asia, if you want to get Interesting. fucked up, especially on New Year's Eve. So we went to Say La Vie, got a table with a bunch of people I don't know. And <laughs> the way they have it in Taiwan, it's it's very high up. It's like 70th floor or something like that. So you can see the fireworks from Taipei 101. But it was so rainy and cloudy that day. We could not see anything. But mm. on top of that, our table was fucking outdoors. Ooh. Out side on the 70th floor. So we were under this big umbrella. I guess all these tables on the outside were set up this way. I could not believe it. And there were heaters on the bottom. But you're just going to get wet because the umbrella is not, it's not like all containing. So yes, weather-wise, it sucked. Crowd-wise, it sucked. It was like so many people. <laughs> it was it was so crowded. Everyone's getting fucked up. You couldn't see fireworks. You couldn't see anything, even though we were like right next door. But what I loved was my partner and I took the subway back. And so we just had like a nice walk and chat after midnight mm, hit. And that was like nice. our alone time. And I really enjoyed that getting home process because we had a, a nice little conversation and some gossip about the people that were there. But as you saw, Julie, everyone 
every Asian in California was in Taipei during New Year's Eve. Kept running into like every Asian I know in San Francisco. So I didn't have to leave California to see these people. <laughs> here we are. You're like, oh, I haven't All seen you in months. Oh, here you are. Yeah. You know, that exactly is why I don't like New Year's, just like the crowds. And, you know, one of our friends is in New York and she, we were like going to hang out with her, but we're like, I bet she's going to go to some like crazy party. And that's what ended yeah. up happening. And, oh, you know, I feel like I'm getting older every year when I don't want to do this as much. I don't want to do that. And the, as soon as I got there, I was like, babe. I don't want to be here. You know, I, I really yeah. don't want to be here because this is not what I want New Year's Eve to be. And he was so great. I mean, just like just catering to me the whole night because I was just not in a good headspace. But I also realized that, OK, I'm ready to say goodbye to this side of me. Yeah. You know, the, I like getting crazy. I like partying. I just don't want to do it on New Year's Eve. I don't want to do it in this kind of crowd either. It was so crowded. And there were so many like younger people there in their 20s that were having a wonderful time. And I remember talking to this girl and she's like, are you having a good time? And I'm like, I'm getting wet. I just bought this new dress. I can't even wear it because I have to bring I have to wear my raincoat right now. And she's like, you can dance in the first rain of 2023. You know, I do <laughs> like, kind of wow. appreciate That's very that, sweet. Though. I appreciate that. I was sweet. like, oh, are we just getting old and bitter? I do appreciate that like fresh look at things. Me too. So we're like a month in right now, right? Mm -hmm. January. And then we're approaching February, which means that we're approaching our next season, which is very, very exciting. Yay. We're also approaching Valentine's Day. We will have a special Valentine's Day prep episode of how to gift, how to deal, all the things next week. But how is kind of like re-entering this new year been for you? Like, has there been any changes or do you just feel like it's continuation? I do have to say, I'm so glad I went to Taiwan because I got to see my partner's hometown. I got to mm -hmm. meet his family and his childhood friends. I recently read this article that was like, if you really want to have a deeper connection with your partner, spend time in their hometown, spend time mm. with their family and their their friends and I totally see that now I felt I feel like it brought a whole new dimension to our relationship and I understand him so much better this time around I'm like okay now I know where you came from now I know why you are the way you are you know he has yeah. a brother who's only a year younger so they're very close and I got to spend time finally with the brother and it was so great to see their dynamic together because I've never seen him be mm. an older brother before and I I found that really attractive you know so I'm, I'm so glad I went I don't regret the trip at all it was just one blip of New Year's Eve but I do think it set a nice tone for the new year because it it is a new chapter in our relationship yeah no, I definitely feel the same way because I just came off of the holidays with my partner's mm -hmm. family and then my family. I'm gearing up to go to Oklahoma to see my partner's <laughs> brother and sister-in-law, a newborn baby. So that will kind of be the next stage. But I agree, just like understanding where they come from. There's aspects of him that I can see more clearly. Yes. And I think that really is ultimately what a relationship is about. I actually saw Vienna Farron, who we've had on this podcast. She is fantastic. She's a marriage and family therapist. That's so funny because where I read about the where I read about knowing your partner's family is also from Vienna. <laughs> <laughs> so we just pull from the same I source. love it. I love it. So she said, your relationship will improve when you prioritize how the other person feels as much as you prioritize how you feel. And that's I think, so you true. know, honestly, I took that to heart. Like, I think that's something that I need to work on a little more. I, you know, we went in our episodes the last couple of weeks of our own dating patterns and how we've overcome some of them, how we're still figuring other aspects out from my episode you probably gathered I've gotten really good at honing in on my needs and what I want mm. but where I need to get better is honing in on my partner's needs and what they want mm. and coming to a place of equilibrium like it can't just be my needs like I'm not saying I should sacrifice my needs but I also need to take into account more the other person in the room because that's truly what a relationship is Mm, I like that. That's a good point. Because we are fed all this advice to know your needs, know yeah. where you stand in the relationship. And I get it. We need to speak up for ourselves and advocate for totally. ourselves. But you also have to advocate for the relationship. And that involves your partner. So I like that reminder not to forget about your 
partner scenes. Yeah, I think honestly, for me, that's the intention I'm bringing into 2023. Like that's where Mm -hmm. I'm trying to kind of be a little more intentional and focused. Like we talk about dating intentionally again of like knowing what you want, but like, how do you look at intentionality? I was actually looking it up the other day because I'm like, what is the actual definition of intentionality? I feel like it's such a buzzword, like woo woo term. It really like at the core just means deliberate on purpose. And it's just being like on purpose with what your actions are. And for me, instead of like jumping to only what I need or my reaction, action from something my partner does, I want to just be deliberate, take a second and think about like, where can they be coming from and have a conversation? Mm. That's my goal. I like that goal. That's a very lovely goal. And it also helps to build empathy. It helps you bring closer together with people. So that's a very, that's a very good goal to have. I might have to steal it for this year (laughs) as well for myself. You know, like for anyone dating right now, I think it's also very applicable We are today re-airing an episode we did with Alana Dunn. We love Alana. She's the host of Seeing Other People podcast. We were on her podcast. We had her on our podcast. We did an episode last season, Is It Chemistry or Anxiety, which was a very popular episode. Such a popular one. I love Alana. I think she's really well-spoken. She knows her shit, but... We were on her podcast and we were really talking about just like the current world of modern dating and like how do we save it? And I do think a big piece of it comes down to, you know, intentionality of your own intentions and your own needs, but also this other side of being more like having your actions and words align, whether that's for your own self, but then also for others. Mm. Alana is so good about that because I think about how she's probably like more than 15 years younger than me. <laughs> and she's, <laughs> she's going to so be so wise ahead. when she gets our age. She's already so wise. Yeah. <laughs> how does she learn so fast? And how is, she, how is she so wise at such a young age? But I appreciate the fresh energy she brings. Like we were talking about with the, with the girl at the New Year's Eve party. Yeah. It's like this fresh, positive energy. And, you know, her whole message is like, modern dating is a little fucked up but it doesn't have to be and if we can all if we can all gather together and recognize that it's a little fucked up and we want to change it we have the power to change it so in this episode we really talk about these heroic efforts of saving modern dating (laughs) but first recognizing what are the mistakes we're making in dating how can we use apps in a healthier way Mm -hmm. is another huge one Um, I feel like there were major takeaways in that one and also like what are some things that we should not even listen to anymore. Some of the antiquated advice that yep. no longer serves us. Which is why, you know, one, we felt compelled to collaborate with Alana because that's very much our mission. <laughs> but also like we both learned from each other. And I think that's really the core of dating is like, how do we look at this more as a learning experience? through every experience, whether it's good or bad. I know that can be really hard when you're in the thick of getting broken up with or getting ghosted, whatever. But looking back, like in retrospect, like I feel like a lot of the skills I learned in dating when it was difficult actually are Mm -hmm. helping me today. And there's clearly more I can learn and more every day I'm exposed to. So the learning never stops. But how do we start to like reframe how we look at modern dating? And this episode should help do that. And just a reminder of a background on Alana, because she talked about it in our episode when she was on our show, but we don't talk about it on this. <laughs> Obviously, on her own show, she's not going to yeah. be like, here's my background. But <laughs> she has such a fascinating background. She fell into this role at Hinge. She became the face of Hinge, was doing all their social media content. She even hosted a podcast with Hinge. And to suddenly be blindsided and be laid off. And she never thought about herself as being like a dating coach or a dating expert. But she had been talking about dating for all this time that she thought, oh, well, I have all this knowledge to share. So yeah. that's what brought her to doing her podcast, seeing other people. So such a fascinating background. Yeah. I mean, I think actually it's very in line with our story too. When you think about it, a lot of our own stuff came from our own struggles. And then 
just the continued talk about modern dating gives you that expertise. So I really do love her background. I think the best experts sometimes can be people that have gone through it themselves and realized Mm -hmm. how do you get out of it, but not just use their own personal stories, but look at like everyone. But I think that's such a big aspect of how do you start to save modern dating is like we all need to help each other. And that's why we call ourselves dating sociologists, because we're more observers, (laughs) researchers, data collectors. To be a dating expert, I feel like if you're dating, you're a dating expert because you're doing it. Yeah, you're doing it. Exactly. Putting in the time, putting the hours. So, well, enjoy this episode. It's such a treat. It's so timely right now because it will help you set some new dating intentions for the new year. But we will be back with the new season so quick before you even know it. We've been hard at work recording And we have some really good ones coming up. I will just give a little sneak preview that we did one about a sex cult the other day. That was a good one. That one was mind blowing. But we've also had some really interesting other topics like why do we pick the partners we pick? Like there's so many interesting things that we're continuing to uncover every season. So make sure you are subscribed if you're not already. That's when you'll get season 16. I still can't believe it. We're back with season 16. So that's what will drop if you are a subscriber. Also, help us out. We would love to get to a thousand reviews. We are like 400 away. And so you know, close. we know that there are so many more of you out there. Like we see our numbers. We know that, you know, the first thing that everyone thinks about isn't always writing a review, but we're just asking you to take two seconds, give us five stars, drop us a line if you feel so compelled. We love reading those. One of the latest ones was about big dateable energy. So we love using the terms and seeing that on the reviews. So thank you in advance for anyone that helps us out there. And then last but not least, at Dateable Podcast on Instagram, go to datablepodcast.com, sign up for our newsletter. We are getting great feedback on this newsletter. If you love the last couple episodes about breaking up with bad dating habits, that's what Mm, the newsletter is focused on. So keep going there. Again, this is really just for us to distill more of our learnings and have ways that we can keep helping people save modern dating. Okay, well, before we get into it, let's hear a message from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by the One Love Foundation. The numbers of people affected by relationship abuse are startling. Abusive relationships rarely start with physical abuse. Instead, there are often red flags like manipulation, isolation, belittling, and volatility. Do you know the signs? One Love Foundation, a national nonprofit dedicated to ending relationship abuse, empowers you to see the signs of an unhealthy relationship before things go too far. Visit joinonelove.org and learn to spot the signs of unhealthy and healthy relationship behaviors. This episode is made possible by Blissey. Now, who knew that a better pillowcase is all you need for better sleep? And this year, you can achieve better sleep with Blissey's award-winning 100% mulberry silk pillowcases. Seriously, silk is what's best for your hair and skin. It reduces frizz, tangles, and prevents breakage. Blissey's pillowcases regulate temperature, keeping you cool at night. And the mulberry silk is naturally hypoallergenic, so no more itching or rashes. Unlike other silk pillowcases, these are of the highest quality silk and are machine washable and durable. From night one, I was already seeing the difference. My hair was so smooth when I woke up. I just rolled out of bed and looked presentable. I seriously woke up like this. Everybody who has tried Blissey loves them. They have a ton of different prints and colors and they make great gifts because there's an option for literally anyone. Try now risk-free for 60 nights at blissey.com slash dateable and get an additional 30% off. That's B-L-I-S-S-Y dot com slash D-A-T-E-A-B-L-E and use the code dateable to get an additional 30% off. Your skin and hair will thank you. Okay, let's hear our episode from Seeing Other People. And we are here in the episode with Julie and Yue. Oh my God, I can't believe we're finally doing this. (laughs) Welcome to seeing other people. (laughs) We are so happy to be here. Thank you, Alana. We love seeing other people with you, Alana. (laughs) (laughs) It's such a funny thing. Like, I feel like once an episode, the phrase seeing other people actually does come into play. And I just actually watched Friends all the way through for the first Mm. time ever. And Mm -hmm. there were probably seven times where like Ross or Rachel or somebody said it. And I'm like, wow. Who knew? <laughs> was that like part of Ross's, you know, 
his like, like we're on a break. Like, he, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like he's like, I was at, at one point it was, it was in that very contentious <laughs> conversation, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Um, <laughs> I am so excited to have you guys on. And I absolutely, first of all, backtracking you guys listening. Um, I went on Datable and mm-hmm. it was such an incredible conversation. So pause this right now. Go head over to Datable. Listen to that episode. <laughs> listen to like 10 more of their episodes. Give them a five-star rating interview and then come back and listen to this one. <laughs> Cool. So fun. See you guys back. <laughs> it was so great. It was so great. Um, but we have a problem here that I would love for us to discuss. And that problem, I think we can all agree, is that modern dating is pretty horrible right now. <laughs> yeah. But it shouldn't have to be. No. So I'd love to hear, first of all, just to catch the listeners up if they aren't familiar with you, what are is going on in your personal lives in terms of like your relationship status. And then what was the most difficult part for you in getting to that point? Julie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Yeah. So I'm about a year and a half into a relationship that I met my partner in the, in the middle, in the midst of COVID. So I am a living proof that you can meet someone during the pandemic And, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like dating has always been one of those things, which is part of why, like, I got into Dateable, that it feels like you should be able to, you know, think your way through it and, you know, learn the skills and almost apply the rigor that you would for, like, finding a job. But I've learned over the years that it doesn't work that way. And so much of it is just feeling. And Mm -hmm. that I think has been the most pivotal moment for me is thinking about like, how do I feel with this person? Rather, like, who should I be with? Who do I think is the right fit for me and starting to use my head less than my heart. So or yeah, that's kind of the biggest thing for me. But you know, the journey of just feeling like I wasn't in control of my dating life. Like I think a lot of people feel like the apps control it. Other people control it and getting to the point of like, okay, I I'm not as focused on does this person like me, but do I like them? Do I like the way I am around this person? Do they bring out my best side? Do I feel good in their company? That I think was really transformational to start putting myself first And I think especially as women, it's hard to put yourself first. We've been socialized with dating for so long that like, you know, all the bad dating books. So I could get back the time I spent reading Why Men Love (laughs) Bitches. Like that book of just like it's, you know, it's trying to put you in control, but you're just like playing games to like get that control. So I think my biggest aha moment was like I can be in control by just being myself. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it's so hard for people to, you know, flip that question of like, not do they like me, but do I like them? Because, you know, we talk about it, we hear it. And it's something that it seems like it makes sense, but it's so hard to actually put into into practice. Mm. There's a lot of validation that comes with dating. And, you know, I feel like especially if it's not going your way, you almost start to see it as a reflection of yourself. Why am I not good enough? And honestly, that was a big part of starting Dateable is that I was kind of in this solo world thinking that like I got to the point that I'm like, I don't even want to tell my friends about this date because in two days, this person's going to vanish. And now I'm going to look like the fool opposed to like who the who knows what was going on with this person. But in my head, it was all about like, how do I come off? How do I prove that like, I'm almost worthy of this relationship. And I think it's until you can take it off a pedestal that like, while clearly you and I believe that love is really essential in life. I don't believe it's the only thing. And we put so much emphasis on it that it causes us to play this almost victim role of like, why am I not good enough? Yeah, I definitely resonate with pretty much everything you just said. And I think it's so hard because we take it it feels so personal and it feels Mm -hmm. like a personal attack on us and who we are. And yeah, like we're not deserving. If this one person that we met one time on a dating app that an algorithm matched us with doesn't want to be with us. And it's like, well, first of all, 
99% chance you weren't compatible anyway, or it wasn't right. going to work out anyway, or you weren't going to like them anyway. But that almost fear of rejection or fear of not being wanted yeah. is mm-hmm. so, so difficult. Well, I think modern dating, especially with app dating, it quantifies the rejection, which we never saw before. Before you walk into a bar and whoever approaches you is interested, you're not seeing all the no's, you're just seeing the yeses. (laughs) But on a dating app, if you're not getting the, the matches of the people that you were trying to match with... You're, it's a quantifiable rejection. And also with the onset of social media, that that rejection is now memorialized. If someone's not <laughs> going to continue dating you and you see them posting with someone else, you're like, I get it now. They've chosen someone else over me. Yes. We would have never seen this before the internet. We, like, we would just go on with our days. That person could be dead. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> and now we're just ruminating in the rejection Versus thinking about, and we always say this, it's not about finding love. Love is not found. It's not like you can just go go into a grocery store and be like, hmm, where's the love aisle? Love is created with the right person. So we can't think about like rejection as these people aren't validating my self-worth. It's just these people were not willing to create love with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we have to understand at the same time, there are so many people that we're not willing to create love with either. Yes. Exactly. But we only focus on the people that don't want it with us for whatever oh, exactly. reason. <laughs> it is the magnitude because I think also like if you get ghosted once, you can write it off. It's not that big a deal. But then when yeah. it keeps compounding, I remember, you know, just going on back-to-back dates, going on like multiple dates a week. And if all of them don't work out, it it really feeds into like what we call dating trauma because yeah. it starts to wear on you and your soul. And we're putting so much power into these people, but it's also only natural that it's going to feel like you're the common denominator when it just keeps happening to you. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting. Like just comparing it to, you know, any patterns we pick up on in our normal lives. Like this literally happened to me an hour ago where I got a DM from somebody who watched my story and said, are your ears naturally like that? Or is is it a medical condition? Oh, shit. and yeah. And I get a lot of comments about my ears being really big and they're really mean comments. And Damn. nine out of 10 times I shrug it off. But every once in a while, that 10th yeah. time, and this happened yep. today, I'm, I, I just like am covered with like rage. And it's like, yes. why? Like, why does, why do, does this random person who doesn't even follow me like, is going to watch my story and then go out of his way to message me something really mean about my appearance that I can't change? And it's one of those things where it's like, I don't care who this person is. I didn't care who the last two people were, but it feels like a pattern and it, it carries weight. And the more it happens, the more it starts to impact you. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the pageantry of what we are living with today. We are parading ourselves and putting ourselves out there for other people to judge. And in turn, we become more judgmental ourselves. So now mm-hmm. we treat dating as if we're swiping through the contestants on our own dating <laughs> show and thinking, yep. yes or no, this could be good. And it doesn't like dating connection human connection it doesn't work like that and we like i think we're forgetting how to build that connection now we just lead with our first impressions the judgments mm-hmm. that we have in our head our unconscious biases and it's almost like if someone puts their face out there even on a dating app we feel like we are it's it's in uh in our control to judge them mm-hmm. yeah and we were not meant to be out there in this way. We were not meant to be judged and judging other people in this way. And I think that's something that's, that makes it even more difficult where like dating apps have obviously brought so much good to the world and have created so many beautiful partnerships, but at the same time, it's caused so much like emotional damage Mm -hmm. because we were never like taught how to use them in a thoughtful way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said earlier that I learned to lean into my feelings more than my thoughts. And I think that definitely is true, but I also do believe that it is a skill that you can learn. 
And we never, we were never even taught how to have human connections in school or anything. So I think some of it's like how to use the data gaps in a way that isn't going to eat at your self-esteem and your self-worth. But also even once you meet someone on dating apps, like I am super pro dating apps. I think it's a great way to meet people that you would never come in contact with. But I agree with you, Alana, like why 10 years later are we still swiping on people's faces? Why hasn't this evolved in any way? It's actually kind of like messed up when you think about it. So I totally hear people when they're like, I just can't do it. Like it's too much for me. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's unfortunate because it is such a great way to actually meet people if you can learn how to navigate it and learn that, you know, it's human people at the end of it. It's not just an algorithm. Exactly. And I think another problem that we see is like, because we're not taught how to use them, we're not actually taught how to you know, set up our profiles and put our best Mm -hmm. foot forward. And so the number of times I talk to people who are coming to me saying like, Oh, I want to fix my profile. And I'm like, well, I take one look at it. And it's so obvious to me why they've had no success or why they're not attracting the right types of people. And that makes me feel so badly for the experience that they've had thus far, because they have the pictures that would help them, you know, attract the right people and achieve more success on the apps. They have the personality traits that are so desirable that everybody wants. They are emotionally available. They want to put in the effort, but they just didn't know how to, you know, sell themselves on a dating app. Right. Right. They didn't know how to market themselves or package themselves, which is something we would have never even thought about doing before. But now all of a sudden you have to make yourself commercial commercial friendly and be marketable to a bunch of people. And that's why people often say it's a numbers game. We truly do not believe in that. It's not a numbers game. You're just looking for one or whatever your relationship, whatever your ideal relationship is. Maybe it's more than one, but we're not looking for a thousand people to be in our orbit. But for some reason, people think it's like, oh, it's a numbers game. It's a numbers game. It's not a numbers game. So we're just not giving people enough time. But yeah. end of the day, I think we always say this on our podcast, no dating app founder started their dating app thinking, I'm going to make your life worse. No. I'm here to be a tyrant <laughs> and to be yeah. the evil monster that will make your love life the worst it can possibly be. They started these apps with good intentions of connecting you with people who you would have never connected with without this tool. We're just misusing it. And I think we're going through these growing pains of using using technology in a human way. And I think we'll get there. We're just in in the trenches right now. Yeah, I think that is so true. And I'm glad you said that because I do think everybody needs to hear it. Like they didn't set out for your stomach to drop every time you got a notification or didn't (laughs) get a notification. (laughs) It's ironic too, that the one thing you don't need in a relationship is a dating profile. Yet there's so much emphasis on the dating (sighs) profile. And yeah, like we are again, super pro dating apps, but I think what we need to do is figure out how to use them to our advantage. And personally, I think like clearly you need to have a profile that can get some people in the door, but ultimately it's not about the profile. It's about the conversation that you're having with other people. And I think so many people like want to save time and read between the lines and like kind of shoot to the end that they overemphasize the profile and don't just have conversations and connect like dating apps kind of are there for the intro. Yeah. Or they'll see one thing on somebody's profile that they don't like. Yes. And they assume, nope, absolutely not. Could never be compatible with this person. I think about this so much because I've been with my partner for four years and I did see his dating app profile. And if I didn't know him before meeting him, (laughs) I would have not swiped on him because there was one photo that really irked me and it was of him <laughs> fake running. You know those photos that people have? Yes. You're like, you're, you're running. Who the fuck is taking your photo? Right? This is a fake running photo. And it really irked me. But if I didn't know him before seeing this profile, I would have been like, no, this is not the guy for me. It's just one little thing. The yeah, best exactly. people on dating apps are the ones with the worst profiles. Yeah. I'm, con- I'm convinced on that because they're the people that are not – pro daters right like they're just there clueless like you were saying about the person you talked to alana they were a quality person ready to date but their profile wasn't 
showcasing that. And while, of course, you can continue to work on your profile, I think the people on the opposite end, we can't be just like taken by shiny syndrome, like sparkly objects, the hottest people on the apps, like they tend to be the worst people on the apps. Yeah. Exactly. They tend, they're going to be the people that are going to be on there for a long time. They're not trying to get off. Yes, exactly. They're, they're professionals. They're getting all the validation. Yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So UA, let's go to you. Where are you at now? And what was it like for you? What were the challenges you faced getting there? Mm, I almost feel like Julie would be better answering this question because she's seen my growth throughout the years. And I love I think that. Oh, she's I can very answer. Proud Don't worry. Of how much I've grown. And I will say growth is the key word here. I've been with my partner for four years. When Julie and I started Datable almost seven years ago, I was in a totally different place. I was by the rules. I had very gendered stereotypes and rules in my head. If someone didn't text me back within two days, I'm like, see you later. It was very if X, then Y for me. And I was just plugging in the formula and I wasn't able to get to a place of deep connection. I was a really good dater. I I had a beautiful profile. Trust me, I spent (laughs) hours on my profile. I was getting the matches that I was looking for, but my dates wouldn't last past like the second date, if if even that. But until this time on our podcast, I went on a blind date with someone and we had to do a post-date interview and he (laughs) called me out so hard. He was like, you're fine on a date, you're entertaining, but I didn't understand you as a human being. Like I didn't understand who you were. And I love that he called me out because he said that I did the normal date talk. I was the mm-hmm. entertainer. I did everything that was just not me. And, and his feedback in the middle of the date was, you know, I'm having an okay time, but I think I'd, I have a better time if I knew who you were. Can you just be real? Wow. <laughs> and it brought me back down to earth. It was such a grounding comment. And so where <sighs> I am today is that I realize it's not about winning people over. It's not about being the most liked or the most popular. It's about creating the love life that works for you. And that may not work for other people or your predecessors. And that is okay. And sometimes it takes going through a lot of people or a lot of experiences to get to this place. And guess what? This is not the final resting place either. We just keep learning and evolving even in a partnership. Yeah, we're still going to grow and we're going to look back in seven years from now and be like, wow, I can't believe I thought like that was the right thing to do in that situation. You know, it's we talked about this on our podcast when you were the guest, Alana, but it's, (laughs) you know, this this date version of you and this feeling Mm -hmm. of needing to be it kind of ties into what I was saying, too. It's like this, you know, this validation of progressing and that you're worthy of love and that you got it kind of thing. Like you're so in your head with that. And does this person like me that you're unable to just connect like you would if you met a new friend or a coworker, anyone else in life, we like reserve this special way of being with the rules and what we should do for dating, yet it doesn't extend to anywhere else in life where it's just baffling when you think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that this person you went on a date with called you out on that <laughs> UA because I think we all have our first date stories that we would tell. And yeah, I, I could probably count. I mean, I don't, I don't know their names now, but there were probably like 20 dates I went on that were the exact same, almost like Mad Libs, like fill Mm -hmm. in slightly different words or like transitions between us sharing stories, but the exact same flow, the exact same drink, sometimes even the same place. And how are you supposed to actually get to know somebody and let somebody get to know you when you're just running on autopilot? And yes. that's why dating is so miserable. And that's yeah. why to go back to like, why do we feel like it sucks so bad? It's because you're doing the same thing over and over again, not getting the results you're looking for. It's compounding to believe that there's something fundamentally wrong with you. Eats at your self-esteem. Like all this goes way further than just having a fun date. You know, it's crazy. But if you think about the fundamentals of human connection, I had play dates when I was a kid. We, when we would go on these play dates, it was intentional that we would 
have fun together. That was it. Mm -hmm. That was our only goal. And if we liked hanging out with each other, we would have more play dates. It was never about what's next. It was just more like in the moment, do I enjoy this? We started out that way. Why is it that in modern dating today, everything is about what's next? When's the next date going to happen? It's We've been dating for three months. When's the DTR going to happen? Well, how are we going to escalate this relationship? It goes, it goes against how we connect as human beings. It's because we view dating as a milestone, an achievement. Yeah. And there, you know, the ultimate achievement that we've been fed to, fed by society on is getting married. And that's why I think we look at it that way. And what's, we don't enjoy the process of getting to know someone. We want to know that it's going to go somewhere. We're not wasting our time. I feel like that's like the number one thing you hear with everyone is like, I don't want to waste time. And maybe it's this perception with dating apps that there's so many people out there. So if I give my time to this person, it means that there's an opportunity cost for someone else. But we also like don't let things evolve that way. Like that's not like it's just like when you think about it, like when else in life would you go meet someone for an hour and then have to make a decision that this is going to be your life partner? Right. Right. Like That's not how friendships work. That's not how anything works at all. That's not even how a job works with a job. You do a bunch of interviews. You do your research like you explore. It's just kind of the same thing. You're exploring different companies, different positions, but you don't just have one sit down with somebody and say, all right, I'm in like yeah. hire me. I'm going to be here and work here for the rest of my life. <laughs> no. And you also, you could be at a job for a year and then decide that it's not a good fit. There's something else better for you. And you don't get upset about it. You don't feel like a failure because of it. You right. move forward. Yeah. I was going to say that it's like, you feel like you failed when things don't work out when it comes to relationships and we're all so afraid of failing. And I think honestly, that's one of the biggest challenges with modern dating too. UA and I call it relationship chicken is that everyone says they want a relationship, but everyone has this fear. It's like, I don't want to show my cards. I don't want to show that I'm more interested because I don't want it to not work out or I don't want to feel rejected because it's a reflection of me again. And then what ends up happening is no one does anything. It's just, a- <laughs> oh, yeah. Stand still. I, I literally, um, you know, I was telling you guys yesterday about this guy that I went out with going into COVID. We ended up like dating for six months. Um, we had actually gone on a first date four months before our second date in mm. October or September and had a phenomenal first date, you know, texted that night a little bit into the next morning And then nothing. Nothing. He didn't text me. I was like, I'll wait for him to text me. And he just like, we went away for work and didn't text me and I didn't text him. And I was sitting on my friend's couch literally months later. And she was like, whatever happened to him? And I'm like, I have no idea (laughs) because that date was so fun and great. And like, I definitely would not have expected to not go on another one. And out of the blue, it was like a Saturday at 4 p.m., I texted him and I was like, so four months later, dot, 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 time for a second date. (laughs) And he was like, absolutely. Yes. When are you free? And we went on a date three days later and then dated for half a year. So it's like (laughs) you, you, it's literally chicken. Like Mm -hmm. just, you're afraid to say something. And the thing is, it's like, people are just want to hear the, from the other person. They want the other person to text them first to ask them out on the date. And what I say is like, it doesn't fucking matter who Mm -mm. sends the text as long as somebody does. Right. Because I think it's like the validation again. I used to be this person. I remember my married guy friend was like, oh yeah, you just like text and say you had a good time. Right. And I'm like, I would never do that. (laughs) You don't know anything about dating. Like you've been married for too long. And then now I'm like, why wouldn't someone want to see that? You know, like that's, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just showing that you want to see this person again like why do we put such an emphasis on this if you went out on a networking lunch you would have no qualms about sending a follow-up ever no matter what even if like you didn't plan to see them again yeah (laughs) yeah and you would want to be the first because you really want to show your appreciation you want to show your appreciation for someone's time and but in dating we we often 
have this power struggle. If I'm the first to text, Mm -hmm. then I've lost my power and now they have the upper hand. Where we get this notion from all those terrible dating books and videos (laughs) and advice and the, the dating professionals of this industry who completely screwed us over in the last couple decades of this. And so it's our our time to change this notion that if you are a decent human being and you spend some time with someone, and even if you don't see a future with them, you still want to show your appreciation for their time regardless. Yeah. It's not that hard to be a decent person. You don't even have to be right. a good person, no. but like right. decent. <laughs> right. I think that's the core of it though. It's like all these like rules and ideas that we've been fed. Like we were talking to a guest on our podcast and she was saying how she just sees these like outlandish ideas on TikTok. And it's like, why are you taking your, like, you know, why are you getting dating advice from TikTok? It's just a random person showing up regurgitating what they thought was a good idea. Like it's not like coming from anything. You have to be the one to decide what works for you instead of just listening to other people like sprout random stuff. I understand Uh, that's ironic because we're doing this podcast right now, but but we're, you know, (laughs) we're not for everyone and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. There are, going to be people who want to follow the rules and play the games and they're going to think that that works for them and and like fine you know maybe they'll get lucky or maybe they'll change their mind but it it is tough because there is no one right or wrong way to do it no and And that's that's where it gets so confusing and that's what we say too. It's like our po- like our podcast, your podcast, like we never dish out like you must do this or you should do mm-hmm. this. It's kind of like take what works for you and leave what doesn't and adapt yeah. to it. The, exactly. The only rule you should ever have in your head is if you feel like you're trying to be a mind reader, that you need <laughs> to just stop and yes. take hold of the situation. That's the only rule to follow. If you ever like, hmm, am I trying to guess what this person's thinking, trying to guess if they like me back, then just freaking do something about it yep. instead of <laughs> ruminating in that. And I want to flip that over and say, don't assume that the other person yes. can read your mind because yeah. they can't. I yes. guarantee yes. you that the person you are talking to is not a mind reader. I mean, you asked what our pivotal moments were, and I think that is that was definitely one of mine. Like I remember with my ex before this partner, like we rekindled the start of COVID. And he was like, You're like a totally different person than when we dated the first time. Mm. And, you know, it was years of doing this podcast. And I think I bottled so much up, didn't share what I wanted, what my needs were, just kind of didn't want to rock the boat, didn't want to make anything not work. And this time around, I'm just like, look, I'm going to just say what I want, what I need. And if you can meet me, then great. And if you can't, then like, we need to have a conversation and see where this goes. Like, no, we, we want to like restrict ourselves so much. And there's this fear of not scaring people away, but I think we can't be afraid to scare away the wrong people. I couldn't agree more. I think everything in, in terms of who you are, in terms of what you want, in terms of what you need Everything is a filter and Mm -hmm. you're going to filter some people out and you're going to filter some people in and not everybody should be able to get through that filter because you're not going to be able to, you know, create love and a partnership with everybody. And that's okay. Before I met my current partner, I got rejected more than I ever have in my entire life, like hands down. And I think looking back on it, it's because I was actually putting myself out there and taking chances. Maybe I was even doing like a second day default, which I didn't do before, because I knew the limitations of dating. I knew that people don't always show their full self. And if it wasn't terrible, if it was good enough, I was willing to keep going with something to just see how it unfolded. That being said, not everyone was willing to do the same with me, or maybe they just saw it wasn't a fit, which is fine. And I think you can get really down about that and start looking at that as a self-reflection. But for me, the biggest thing I did was just keep going. Like, I think that was the path. And then eventually it led me to my now partner who was like there for it, you know, like Mm -hmm. I'm so glad all those other ones didn't work out because this was the right person that appreciated me for who I was. Like same. It's a mirror story of you and Jake, Alana, right? Yeah. Same thing. It's like he showed up every time he was consistent and 
that's what happens. Like if it works, it works and you just keep going because it works. Yeah. And you can't predict if it's going to work or not work. But I think another thing people get wrong is that if it doesn't work, I know we, we kind of touched on this earlier, but like just because it doesn't work doesn't mean it was a failure. No. You know, if you don't end up together, that's not a failed relationship. Yeah. Like you yep. probably grew so much and learned so much about being a partner, about what your needs are, what you do and don't want. And yeah. that's something to be proud of and to be able to say like, okay, I did this thing and, you know, it didn't end up in a forever life partner situation, but there's so much that I gained from it. And I'm Mm -hmm. going to take all of that and move forward. Let's hold that thought for a quick message. Have you ever thought about how much better dating would be if you had a whole army of people supporting you along the way? We know that dating can be frustrating and lonely, but it can also feel fulfilling and fun. Have you recently decided you want to make some changes to your love life? Maybe you've recently re-entered the dating scene. Maybe you've gone on one too many dates that went nowhere. Or maybe you're just ready to take your current relationship to the next level. That is exactly why we created The Sounding Board, a true extension of our podcast that delivers a personalized experience, which includes monthly office hours where you can drop in and chat with us about anything, weekly sound offs with guided discussions, and regular virtual happy hours. Allow Julie and I to become your dating Sherpas to provide real-time guidance and wisdom in a more intimate way so we can all navigate dating and relationships together. Join the sounding board today by going to datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. Again, that's datablepodcast.com slash sounding board. So much is a mindset reshift for sure, but also taking being in a relationship off a pedestal. For me, getting to the point, I think the pandemic was pivotal. Like I found myself alone in the pandemic. I had that immediate freak out moment at the time I thought I'd be alone for two and a half weeks. Fast forward year, <laughs> years later. But I remember like initially being like, oh my God, my worst fear is coming true. Like in the time of need, I'm by myself. And I soon realized like it, if this was life on your own, it's not so bad. Like if you build up your life and you have love in other places and you have passions and things that are fueling you, you realize that like a relationship's a cherry on top. And, you know, I think it's like people that are in the thick of it, I'm sure like are rolling their eyes a little, but I think like looking back on it, if you can kind of detach from this outcome of being in a relationship, if the goal of a relationship is to be happy, like how do we just get happy now? And then it brings it from a place of need to a place of want, which allows the right people to come through and for you to be more like, okay, is this person adding to my life? I'm going to keep going. If not, Mm. then, you know, like I choose myself. I'm just going to like do my thing. Exactly. I love that, like making the goal to actually be happy outside of what's going on in your dating life. And yes, of course, you could be happy and then get into a relationship feel happier and then it ends and then you're very sad. But that doesn't mean you don't have all these other great things going on in your life that you've created for yourself that do bring you happiness. Like you're allowed to feel sad in between. I think that we need to normalize a couple things. One is there is absolutely no, no quality that you're putting on or at least no judgment between being single, being in a relationship and dating. Those are three just stages. It's not good, bad. And know that in your lifetime, you're constantly in a relationship. If you're not in a relationship with other people, you're working on the relationship with yourself. And even in a relationship, a partnership, that is broken up into several little relationships too. In my four years with my partner, I can say we've probably been in 20-ish relationships. And that's (laughs) great. I love that. I can say in the beginning of our relationship, we had this mini one that was like really flirtatious and playful. And now we're in a very serious one or we're we're just constantly evolving. So we can normalize the beginning and end of relationships as a great thing because we're just closing a chapter and moving on. It could be in a relationship. It could be not in a relationship. That's a that's something we need to just embrace. And the end is not a bad thing. We can't just we can't put a value on these things. Yeah. And even within that, like people, you know, judge themselves and their own relationships for like, oh, well, you know, we're 
in month seven. So we're in the honeymoon phase. So right now we have to really enjoy it because it's all downhill from here. And then uh, people will ask like how long someone else has been in a relationship and then they'll make a snap judgment because of that. And like I questioned for a while, I'm like, am I in the honeymoon phase? Am I not? Was I ever like, I, it's just so confusing. And it's so complicated that we have like feel the need to attach labels to things instead of just feeling what we feel and acknowledging it and moving on and living our life. I love this idea of like, it's just all chapters of your life. And like, how do we start to just focus on the process? And, you know, in retrospect, all the relationships of mine that ended, I'm so glad they did. And like, they Mm -hmm. built on each other. And who I am today is because of those past relationships. And when you're in the thick of it, it's terrible, right? Like when you feel like you've lost the love of your life, I don't want to undermine that feeling because I've been there before and not being able to get out of bed. And it's the worst. But if we can have the foresight to look at our past and look at how things have like actually built on each other, then it can just show that we're like, this is what's meant for us. We're moving to a new world. Exactly. Exactly. I want to switch gears because there's a topic that I've been very excited to talk to you two about. (laughs) And ironically, you just put out an episode on it. So hopefully you're tired about about it. But, and, and we did mention it earlier, this concept of red flags Mm -hmm. and you know seeing one thing about somebody and immediately writing them off and I think the three of us all agree that our society has become so obsessed with red flags and chasing these flags I know in you guys say it's like playing capture the flag Mm -hmm. (laughs) and like how did we get here and (laughs) what it's so frustrating it's, I'm, I'm like frustrated trying to explain what I'm trying yeah. to say. But why do you think we got to this point of being so obsessed with finding these red flags and immediately writing people off? It's a pageantry of dating. Again, we feel like if people are putting themselves out there, we are, it, we are free to judge them and to make snap judgments. I think some of this comes from this culture. We call this like a microwave culture where we're, we just want instant results. We put something in the microwave, expect it to be heated, and we don't care about the consequences. Yeah, it's probably bad for us and it'll probably cool down really fast. It's the same thing. It's like we want to make these snap judgments so we can be more efficient in our filtering. Yes. But we're filtering. Wait a second. I'm sorry. I have to pause you. Does food get colder <laughs> quicker when it's microwaved as opposed to in the oven? I mean, for that's from my own personal experience. <laughs> I need to research this. I'm mind blown. Okay, continue. <laughs> I had to... Oh my god. Um, that's absolutely like if I'm yes, yes, from my personal experience, that's that's what's happened. But I, I like I just need the immediate gratification, right? I yes. just need it to be hot right now. If you I can pop it about... back in for another thirty seconds. Yes, never exactly. tastes as good ever. Never if tastes you took the time to never put it in the oven. Never tastes as good. <laughs> But if we can, the red flag search is because we feel like this is our way of being efficient in how we filter for a partner. And also it's a defense mechanism. It's like, well, I, you know, I'm not going to pursue a second date or I never, I didn't like them anyway, because there were all these red Mm -hmm. flags. It's just an easier way to protect ourselves and a quicker way to judge someone not based on anything substantial. Yeah, I think it stems from a couple things like this, the instant culture, like when you think about it in every other part of our lives, you can get an Uber at the touch of your fingertip, right? A car will show up in two minutes. And if you have to wait 10 minutes, you are just so impatient, (laughs) right? I'm just like, cancel, call Lyft, like this is ridiculous. (laughs) And then, you know, every aspect of life, we think that we can order a soulmate on Amazon, like we can just press the buttons we need, they pop out there we go. We're good to go. Like we don't have to go through the whole process of dating because everyone thinks the process is miserable, which is what we were talking about earlier. It's like, I don't want to go on another date. I just want to get to the end where I'm in that relationship. So the red flag hunt is a way for us to almost like if we were to go on Amazon and put in all the things we want or the things mm-hmm. we don't want to find this person that magically gets spit out. And that like basically saves us the heartache 
of realizing later that there's a problem. And I think the red flag hunt at the end of the day, it's a protection mechanism. We are there. And I, you know, it almost minimizes actual red flags that are happening because there are a lot of real red flags that we should be cautious of. Like the definition of a red flag is reason to take pause for some behavior that would be unhealthy in a relationship. Yet we use the term red flag if someone spells their wrong or something like, is that really going to impact the health of your relationship? No. So it's like the minimization of all the big things. Like, yes, I think it's really bad if you are in a verbally or physical, like physical abusive relationship. Like that is a true red flag in my opinion, but we're now minimizing that and focusing on any little thing that could potentially go wrong opposed to seeing the good in people. And we all have red flags if we look hard enough. You yeah. just answered so <laughs> many questions I had and, and even like led into some of the next ones, but I, you're completely right. Both of you. And it's so, you know, I get really frustrated when I see all of these posts on social media. And again, it goes back to social media, I think being a big root of the problem, but listing here are the red flags. And it's like, Mm -hmm. well, first of all, it's not a red flag if somebody doesn't confirm a date before 11 a.m. It'd be nice if they did, but you also can confirm. It's not a red flag if somebody double texts or sends a few emojis in their text. If you don't usually text with emojis, like, well, guess what? They do and you don't. And that doesn't mean you're not compatible. Yes. But so we see all of these people like defining like, here are these red flags. And then what? That just makes 99% of the population undateable. Like... (laughs) If we actually, you know, assigned meaning to all of these little red flags, there's not a single person out there that we can date because everybody has red flags. Yep. And actual red flags, not these superficial, dumb, fake ones. And no one knows your rules. Like you're just creating this in your mind, right? That's exactly it. And they can't read your mind. The, you know, the amount of research that have gone into how people date in their home country versus in a different country is mind blowing. Because when you date in a different country, you don't do the red flag hunt because you just chalk it up to cultural differences. You don't think, well, this person texted yes. this this word wrong. That's a red flag. You think, how cute. Like they're trying... <laughs> We're trying to speak the same language here. And it, it's because when we go to a different country, we... Uh, actually increase our empathy for other people. So we're open to hearing about their culture and how they mm-hmm. how they do things, how they live life. Why can't we have the same amount of empathy for the people in our hometowns, in our home country, and just don't think about these as red flags, as, as opportunity to learn more about this person? I love that example you gave. Somebody asked me in a Q&A on Instagram this week, Like, what are my thoughts on people from different countries and cultures dating? And I'm like, that is so exciting and fun. And you might need to be a little patient and ask a lot of questions, but just be open to learning a lot about them. And I think that they, these two people in this situation probably have a much better chance of actually surviving than two people who are from the same place. We and to assume this, they know everything about the other person. Yep. Yeah. And we started this convo of like, why is dating so miserable? Why does it suck so bad? And I think expectations is a big part of it. Lack of curiosity, feeling like we have this rule book, this playbook that we know exactly what we want. We need to just find it. We're going to, you know, not treat people like humans and just like they're an object that we can buy online and mark off the red flag so we don't have to waste any time that it's so transactional like that mentality versus just going out and having fun like i actually on my first date with my partner we had a guest on our podcast that's a play expert and he talked about like how do you make dating fun again And so many people look at it as another job that we got to go on these date reviews. We got to treat this with the rigor we would to like our professional lives and grill everyone and make sure we're making the right fit. Like that is just not a fun date to have. And I was definitely guilty of that. I remember there were some dates that I thought like, you know, sharing all my past trauma and burying my soul was the key to like bonding. And those usually like resulted in me getting ghosted. And the one... (laughs) 
<laughs> and I think it's like because I was trying to fast track to the end and like make sure that all the boxes were checked and there weren't any red flags and there weren't any issues. And that was not the right method. Like when I just approached my date with my partner now is just, hey, I want to like go meet a person and have fun and yep. whatever happens, happens. There's time for the deeper conversations later. Like they don't need to happen on date one. We treat it like it's our only chance and we want to get everything out. But the problem with that mentality is that it's just TMI, like too much at once. Like it's overkill. Yeah, it really is. And look, we're all guilty of going on dates like that. I mean, look, I remember there was one specific date. I thought it went so well. I was like mm-hmm. so into this guy, thought we connected so deeply. Was it Brad? It was not Brad. <laughs> <laughs> you always do with these Brad. trauma dubs but, too, right? <laughs> right. And this guy did not ask me for another date. I don't even think he texted me after. And I was so confused. And I think it was like a year later where I finally figured out like, this guy probably left the state thinking this girl is psychotic, but also not knowing actually anything about me. And guess what? I didn't learn a single fucking thing about him because I didn't shut up the whole time. And that's why I thought it went well. Cause people like when they talk about themselves. Yeah. Oh Oh yes. When you're on the red flag hunt and you're doing the date review, you're not focused on the other person right. and having a conversation like you think you are because you're asking them questions, but you're thinking about like, what's next on my checklist? What do I have to, and you're not listening, like, what do I have to like learn about them? You're not listening to their actual answer. You're just like right. mentally checking things off. Exactly. What's funny about that is we often get this question. I'm sure you do too, Alana. It's like, what should I talk about on a date? Yeah. What are what are some conversation prompts? And it boggles my mind. It's like you're two humans. You have you are mere <laughs> strangers trying to catch up on what 20 plus, 30 plus, 40 plus years of your life, and you don't know what to talk about. What <laughs> you know, why does it have to feel so contrived? Why can't we yeah. just get to know each other? Because that's all it is. We're strangers getting to know each other. That's what, what life's if, about. You you spend your entire life talking to people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this one of the different. best dates I ever had was with an ex-partner of mine. And we just talked about like pulling pranks on our friends for the first half an hour. There was none of the date talk. It was just like two people that were connecting over random things. And, you know, as friends, like friends would, you don't sit there thinking about like, I need to ask my friends this 10 list of questions. Like you just have a conversation and see where it flows. And we think, again, it comes back to like, we need to make the right call and we can't waste time. Like, let's get it all out immediately. Like, it doesn't work that way. It just Mm -hmm. leads to people feeling like they were like pressed in a job interview. Yeah, I think the harder we try to almost meddle in our own lives and force things to work or force the answers to come to us, the harder of a time we're going to have actually finding what we're looking for. Yeah. I think the key to see to saving dating and to getting (laughs) out of this is to treat each other like humans and strive for connection over, you know, compatibility and like, you know, making sure that we're doing the right thing all the time. Like let's just focus on how do I connect with this person in front of me and let the rest unfold. Yep. It's so beautiful, but it's so crazy that it's such a wild concept to people. Seems so simple, but yeah, so hard to achieve. We can get there though. Anybody listening to this podcast, you know, this is like, if you're listening to this, obviously you're already on this train and (laughs) three of us are helping you move along on this train. Let's, let's just get this movement going because we see the light at the end of the tunnel. You're on the right train already. Exactly. We see it for you. So yeah. now now you can go out there and see it for all of your friends and family and coworkers who are also struggling. Yes. It's like any time there's that moment, right? Like, should I send the text? Should I do this? Like, look at where is this coming from? Like, if I do this, am I coming from a place of being needy or connecting? If it's yeah. connecting, 
you know, and also the word needy is such like it. Uh, that one really bothers me. And dating. We all it's have like, needs. We're all yes, needy. Exactly. Be like needy. being needy, like, you know, being like, needy. Would, would your friend think you were needy if you were texting them? No, literally. No. It would, would they ever think twice about the fact that you double texted them or texted Never. them first? Literally with no. the emoji. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. To wrap this up. First thing that comes to mind, each of you, best piece of dating advice you've ever received. Oh my god! Uh, I know it's hard. I know. I was like, we have a lot of bad dating advice we've received. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I don't know if this counts. It kind of does. Like, I would say there's not like one that's standing out of like an expert that said something. But I remember when I was really struggling with dating, my best friend was just like, "I don't understand. Like, you are a social per- person." why is this like happening? Like, are you actually being yourself? And it made me realize like I wasn't being myself. I was being the date version of myself and I wasn't looking for a relationship because I wanted one to like a person to share my life with. Like I was looking at it, like all my friends had a relationship and I want someone that's out with me and my friends. And I think her saying it and putting it in perspective is like, how do you just show someone yourself? That has been the best dating advice I ever got because it made it real clear that I wasn't doing that. Absolutely. It's a good one. The best piece of dating advice I ever got was from my mom. Julie knows exactly what I'm about to say. Uh, yes. I was I was an, a very anxious dater with this one guy, Alana. You know how that is. And he <laughs> he was not texting me back when I wanted. He was not giving me what I want, but I was just so into him because of his lack of communication. And my mom finally sat me down. She's like, can you imagine being in a relationship with this sort of behavior? If your goal is trying to be in a relationship with him, yeah, is this sustainable? And I was like, oh my God, mom, you're amazing. Thank you. For <laughs> I that. love that. That is, yeah. I think a lot of people are going to hear that and be like, oh shit, that's <laughs> what I'm in right now. Yeah. Julie, UA, thank you so much for being here. To everyone who tuned in, thank you so much for listening. Don't forget, go check out Dateable. Go check out the episode that I was on on Dateable, but all of their other episodes. Give a five-star rating and review to seeing other people if you haven't yet, and then go and do it to Dateable if you haven't yet. (laughs) And I will see you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in. The Dateable Podcast is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcast. Want to continue the conversation? First, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter with the handle at Dateable Podcast. Tag us in any post with the hashtag stay dateable and trust us, we look at all of those posts. Then head over to our website, datablepodcast.com. There you'll find all the episodes as well as articles, videos, and our coaching service with vetted industry experts. You can also find our premium Y series where we dissect, analyze, and offer solutions to some of the most common dating conundrums. We're also downloadable for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Overcast, Stitcher Radio, and other podcast platforms. Your feedback is valuable to us, so don't forget to leave us a review. And most importantly, remember to stay dateable. With Tim Hortons Two Hot Breakfast Sandwiches for six bucks deal, you can mix and match your favorites. Mix and match between savory sausage or naturally hickory smoked bacon. Mix and match between an English muffin or flaky biscuit. Any two served with a freshly cracked egg and melted cheese. You can even mix and match how you share it. One for you, one for them. Two for them or two just for you. There's no wrong way to mix and match this tasty deal. Two breakfast sandwiches for just six bucks. It's time for Tim's. Limited time at participating U.S. restaurants. Single item at regular price. Modifications and tax extra. Additional terms apply.